Uh, my name is Chris, so first of all, welcome, welcome, welcome. So these new digs are new to me, so you pass my little Kentucky cabin as you were uh, kind of coming in. Sorry about the long drive. It's like halfway through Howie in the Hills by the time you get back or back in here. Uh, one of the things you might have noticed on the way in, uh, the cows we've just rotated out of those pastures, the tall, spiky things that you saw in the pastures is a crop called sun hemp. So we were using that one this year to repair nitrogen in the soil. And we'll talk a little bit more about it later, but that is what you, what you saw as you came in. Um, so this property here, we have uh, 265 acres. We've got about 120-ish cattle. We're kind of at the end of calving season, so it's like how many today? You know, it's about, about 120. Uh, and so the, the calves and the cows are in the pasture behind us, so we'll be able to go and see them uh, a little bit later today. So just to kind of give you a, a summary of what to expect, we're going to take about 45 minutes to an hour or so in here uh, to kind of talk together. Then we're going to go outside, divide into two teams, uh, and actually plant along one of the, the pasture edges so we can get our hands in the dirt because that is what we all love to do. Uh, and then we'll come back inside to cool off and do a little bit of Q&A uh, to kind of wrap things up. And so we will go and see some of the equipment. So if you're you know in the market for a no-till drill or something, then you can take pictures of the equipment or bags of seed and that sort of thing. Um, the notes that are on the screen for you, uh, we'll email those to you afterwards uh, with a list of all of the links to the things that we're gonna talk about. So this is not a paid advertisement for any of these companies with the exception of um, bio livestock. The farm does get a 3% um, return for an affiliate on those. But just so you know, none of the equipment, none of the seeds, none of the you know the other farms that we recommend, none of those are, are paid advertisements or anything. Um, so any questions before we, we jump in? So obviously the reason why you signed up is you probably either have or are looking at getting livestock. Now we are in this room, we are the niche of the niche of the niche of people. So when you look at Central Florida, it's a niche anymore to be a farmer, let alone to be a regenerative agricultural farmer, let alone a perm permaculturist that wants to do bioregenerative ag and silvo pastures. We are the niche of the, which means we're just a bunch of nerds that are together in one room. Uh, so what I'm excited about is this is a, a topic I've wanted to really jump into for a long time uh, because there's not really a great model in Florida for how to do regenerative agriculture when it comes to livestock. Uh, across the nation, you know, th there are so many incredible farms, models, people that are, you know, running chickens and goats and whatever after their cattle, uh, incredible systems, but Florida is just different. It's a very different ball game. Now, I know every state likes to go, well, our state is very different. You've never experienced the humidity of whatever, and, and I've lived in quite a few different places in the U.S. Florida is the only one that I've been in that is actually telling the truth. The, our weather really is the worst and it, the humidity and the, the variables and the hurricanes and lions and tigers and bears. Oh my, there are so many variables that we have in Florida that other states just don't have to confront. Uh, we don't have the clockwork weather systems uh, and patterns that many states do. We don't have the soil that holds organic matter that most states do. So we have a lot of challenges when it comes to farming that many states just never have to confront. And so to be able to look at what Joel Salatin is doing is a fantastic system for where he's at. It is not a copy and paste method when it comes to Florida. It, it doesn't work in the same way. And so what I'm excited about is to be able to not only talk about this, but I would love to begin an ongoing dialogue to see how can we mine out what actually works and change our systems a little bit. Now, what I don't want to do today is be be presumptuous, we're not gonna throw out the baby with the bathwater because what I am not saying and I will not say the entire day today, the things that we have done, it's not that they are wrong and evil and terrible and horrible, that's, that's not what I'm saying. But I think if we make some tweaks to what has been done, to what we are doing, 
I think we can find a really successful system here in Florida. Now, this farm here, I am new on this farm. I've only lived here for about a month and a half, two months. So we're just at the very beginning of doing things on this site. The things that we're gonna talk about today, um, in the four and a half years that I've been living in Florida, uh, we've tested these on about 50 different um, sites that I've done permaculture designs for. I design for about 75 people a year, uh, designing on their, their farm, on their property, on their homestead, I would say probably 80 to 90% of them have animals, livestock, and they're anywhere from just two or three medium-sized farms, and about a dozen or so a year are above 100-acre farms that are doing a little bit larger scale livestock. And so these systems we've tested in what we'll call an anecdotal way, so we have not um, gotten into the, the lab results and that sort of thing on many of those sites. Some of them, however, we have. Uh, I'm of the mindset that we do need to balance hippie science with academic science. Uh, there is a lot of truth in what, um, you know, some of the, the, the hippies and the earth tree huggers and whatever, there is some good fact in that, but it's not all accurate and backed by science. And because I was a teacher for 15 years, I love using the scientific method. Uh, in fact, right now I'm doing the scientific method the last mm -hmm. calendar year on that thing called electroculture, if you've ever seen the, the YouTube videos on electroculture, and so I've got about eight um, beds that I have with uh, with control groups, obviously, to follow the scientific method, studying the soil biology, the NPK, and sending that off to UF to, to study you know, the before and after. So one of the things that we'll talk about at the very end of this is when you leave and you get the email for follow-up, um, if you are interested, I'm gonna give away three of the eight plant sets of the bamboo, moringa, you'll see the plants later, um, as, uh, a way for us to study this and mine it out together. There is an application, um, but you don't have to, to pay anything. It's literally just apply because I wanna make sure that the three sites that we're doing semi-comparable things, that we're testing our soil, we're watching the rumens of our animals, but I would love for us to, to figure this out together. I think it would be arrogant at the very least on my end if I stood here and pretended like I have all the answers. I don't think any of us have all the answers, but I think we have experience. I think we've watched, we have observed, we've tried, we've tested some things, we've seen what's worked on our site and what's worked on our neighbor's site, but I think it's time for us to start really coming together and coming up with something concrete and doing the, the scientific method, sending soil tests off, testing the animal rumen and the blood levels and really getting ultra nerdy beyond the hippie science. So I don't want to devalue either of those sides, but I think there's a healthy place for us in the middle of the science and the, the folklore science that people have passed on. So what I would like to do is I want to talk about first the why behind it. Uh, I mean, obviously, Florida being a very different type of a growing zone. Uh, practically speaking, we all probably experienced during 2020, the shortages of animal feed and the availability of even animal medical products. I remember the farm that I was living on, the first couple weeks that COVID hit, one of the cows had prolapse and we went to tractor supply company and you couldn't get bandages and sutures and ivermectin, nothing was available. And so we had to go back to the old army method of put a glove on and up you go and then using um, super glue as sutures because that was the only thing that was available during COVID. And it's funny because 10 years ago, if somebody would have said, well, bagged feed won't be available, it was like, okay, what random crazy conspiracy theorists are you listening to? And now we're going, well, crud, the conspiracy theorists were kind of right in some of those scenarios. So how do we prepare if we're not able to get bagged feed. And honestly, even if you don't buy into the conspiracy thing at all, which I don't buy into all of them either, the reality is feed costs are insane right now. And we'll cover some of the facts on these. And I did cite a lot of the sources that are on here. So you, you'll get these notes at the end if you wanna dive in. But the reason why for me that I wanna dive deeper into this, number one, is it gives us an off-grid solution for our, our animals. And that off-grid could be because whether it's a, a pandemic 
pandemic or something. It could be just stores don't have it available. It could be that Ukraine supplies most of the world's urea and nitrogen costs go through the roof and we're just not able to do what we did before. Just random examples that happen to be true in the hour that we're living in. Uh, secondly, uh, just returning to a more ancestral diet for our animals. What would these animals have consumed in their countries of origin and are we supplying something similar in this context. And then last but not least, and honestly, this is a big one, is it just saves money. Because honestly, feed costs anymore are so ridiculously expensive. Right now, and this is, these are all the, the sites that, that I've sourced, it's about $2.90 per head per day to feed your cattle. It's three, to, depending on the, the type of feed that you use, three to $10 per head for a horse. For goats, it can be up to $1.80 per head per day. And that adds up really fast especially if you're doing hay, if you're doing bag feed. Now, if you're trying to do non-GMO or organic, my goodness, I mean, the difference right now in chicken feed is 15 to $20 for a junk feed, or you're spending $37 for a bag of non-GMO whole seed, you know, that can be fermented, which is almost not doable in most scenarios, you know, in general. Sweet feed, just the last couple years, look at the price jump. I mean, this is just insane in a couple years. Chicken feed is almost double, you know, just to do a, a dumb crack corn, which crack corn and sweet feed, if we're really honest, is basically the livestock equivalent of a Krispy Kreme donut. Can they survive on sweet feed and crack corn? Absolutely, it's Krispy Kreme. But my cows love it. Well, I love Krispy Kreme too, beloved. I love my Starbucks in one hand and the Krispy Kreme in the other, but it doesn't mean it's good for me. It's you know, a party to get me to diabetes faster. And that's really what it's doing to our, our animals. There are some beneficial things in there that are in maybe that sweet feed, but the way that we feed it to our cattle as a primary daily source is questionable at best. And I, I think we would, we would agree in that. So before we get into all of the, you know, the, the details and the gore of it, I do want to be really honest that changing cattle and livestock or chicken raising methodologies is really a hot topic. And it, it unfortunately, whether it's in groups of farmers or even within families, can be a very challenging conversation. Um, I know the, the owners of a company that sells like 80% of the, the pork to Tyson and Hormel, uh, massive, massive pork suppliers. And even within that family, now they're in a fantastic place now, the beginning conversations of, well, let's kind of get off some of the antibiotics and start using more vitamin D supplementation, those initial conversations were very challenging, very challenging, because it's it's two generations. And the problem is, is that when those two generations start having those, those conversations, we're taking with us all of the baggage from every other area of our lives into a farming conversation. And does that make sense? And so we're bringing with us arguments that really shouldn't even be in the room, that shouldn't even actually be on the table. So even in a group of farmers, we all like the way that we've done it. I always laugh with my mom and dad. Their, their parents right now are in their 80s and early 90s. And my grandpa's favorite phrase, if you want to do something different is, oh, I can't do that. Well, how come? Well, that's the way I always done it. Well, what do you mean? Well, I always done it that way, so I can't do it another way. So the latest thing right now is eggs for my grandpa. He has always had white eggs. Always had, well, those brown eggs taste terrible. I, I can't have those. And so finally, he decided to try this year. Now, granted, he's like upper 80s to try a brown egg, and we kind of snuck it in. You know what I mean? Like, literally snuck it in. Couldn't, he couldn't tell the difference. And so now he's like, well, I want the white eggs, but... If the brown eggs are available, you could get a couple of those too in there, I guess. You know, and so th for him, it was literally this lifelong journey to try a different color egg because he was convinced the brown egg just wasn't as good. It wasn't as healthy. It tastes different. It was raised different, you know, whatever the reasoning was. But the hurdle had nothing to do with the egg. It just wasn't how he was used to doing it. It was just a slightly different rhythm. You know, I, I, and I'm the same way. You know, I have a morning routine 
if I don't do my same morning routine, I get up in the morning, I have my cup of coffee, I do one loop all the way around the yard, I take pictures of a couple plants because I got to see what's blooming, then I refill my coffee for the first time of many times that we won't get into quantity in this conversation, and then I head out to the chickens, and then once the chickens are done, then I set that coffee down, possibly picking up a to-go mug that has a lid, then I get on the golf cart, then I go around and do the cattle. I have a morning rhythm. Now on mornings, like this morning, where I didn't do that exact rhythm, I'm thrown off all day. I'm, I'm literally going, oh, but, but did I do that cow? Did I get my eyes on that? Did I, did I, did I, did it? And my whole day gets jarred all over the place because it wasn't the way that I always did it. Now when farming, the biggest question and, and hurdle that we have because it's the way we've always done it is people say, well, if I change what I'm doing with my animals, how in the world are we gonna feed the world if we change the way we do things? If we get away from synthetic fertilizers, from chemicals, from you know doing our pastures a certain way, how is America going to feed the world? Now, are we one of the number one food exports on the planet? Absolutely. But the question is, should we be? I, I think there's a problem in permaculture you know, we're always taught that every element needs to have four connections, be supplied by four other things. We want things to be healthy and to not be an island unto themselves. Now, when one element, a plant, is fully reliant on getting water from you every single day, the moment you are out of that equation, it's all dead. Why would we do that to another country or a people group? Let them be fully reliant on us as the ones that are supplying their food or their water or their education. Perhaps a better way to do that is instead of giving them a fish, let's teach people how to fish in a way that works in their actual climate, in their growing zone, with their cultural history, with their practices, with the anthropology of their people. So I do agree that if we were to change the way that we do agriculture in America to a more sustainable way, would we be able to feed the world? Possibly not, possibly not. But I just don't know that we should be the one that has the answer to that question. There is perhaps a better use of our time and our energy. So in Florida, some of the, the hurdles that we have are a little different. Uh, we have, uh, just like in any category, whether we're talking about banking and investments or farming, we have ideas about certain things that are quite possibly not so. So for example, when we talk to people about the native uh, ecology in Florida, many people think of, well, the Florida live oaks. Well, before 1894 and 1897, when the logging industry came through, the vast majority of Florida was pine. So what happened when we logged the entire state of Florida and took out that pine, the only trees that, and species that were able to survive had high tannins and could deal with the acidic soil, those were the oak trees. The oak trees were a secondary species that are fairly new to Florida. Now were they here? They were here, they were just very small in number. But when we remove those longleaf pines, the entire landscape of Florida drastically changed. I remember talking with a Seminole Indian medicine woman and she was saying it's very hard for their tribe because all of their ancestral traditions and their plants, many of those plants don't exist anymore. And so for them to forage and eat native off of the Florida landscape, it's not the Florida landscape that it was 150 years ago, which is how, they're, how they survived. And so when we look at even the grasses that we call native Florida grasses, they're actually not native Florida grasses. So like the Bahia grass is native to South America and Paraguay, Argentine grass, let's just think about that, it's from Argentina. Does that make sense? So it's like when we look at our grasses, St. Augustine grass has nothing to do with St. Augustine, Florida. It's the actual saint, like patron Saint Augustine, that was in South Africa and, in, and traveled to Central America. So when we look at a lot of the things that we think are native, a better term is they've been naturalized here. They, they appear to be native, they're thriving, they're doing well, they're you know covering our pastures, and they do provide forage and fodder, but are they actually native here? Not really, but the reality is I'm not native either. So, you know, sometimes native is not necessarily the answer. But what I think when we get in the permaculture world, there are a lot of folks that are th in the native only mindset. Now the reality is nowhere on the planet is native only anymore. We have moved so many seeds and so many animals and so many people and so many bacteria and so much fungi 
it, it's a world system, you know, anymore. And so do we want to preserve as much of the natural ecosystem as we possibly can? Of course, of course. I, I would love to be able to plant mostly native things, but at the end of the day, Number one, I'm not a native. Number two, most of the food that I consume is not native. You know, think about when you go pick up your grocery store stuff. Tomatoes are not native to America. Peppers are not native to America. Squash, barely native. Maybe down like in Mexico is the, the first, you know, areas that we see them kind of being, being native. Most things that we consume, especially our meat, is not native. Now, if we were going back to a native, you know, purchasing, this is what the meat section in your grocery store would look like if we were truly believing in you know native sources now do I eat and consume a lot of those oh yeah I I'm a deer hunter through and through I will be gone Thanksgiving probably until the first of the year because I got to have my deer season in I love being able to consume those things now are most people downtown Orlando gonna have access to deer and bison and rabbit probably not and honestly probably most of them are going well is there a vegan version of pheasant you know they're, they're not consuming mostly those you know mostly those things so when we look at the things that we're raising none of the animals that we're consuming are actually native to this this part of the planet you know the cattle is mostly turkey uh, northeast africa horses are uh, swana is southwest asia north africa you know goats are southwest asia north africa chickens are mainly indonesia and southeast china so most of the things that we consume are not from here so in Instead of us trying to feed them on a native diet of things that are from here, what if we started asking ourselves, what would have been available to them in Pakistan? What would have been available to my goats in Southwest Asia, North Africa? And could we start bringing some of those things here in a way that they can be naturalized? Now we do wanna be be wise you know we're not going to bring in crazy invasive species kudzu vine or whatever that's going to take over the planet you know or the the running bamboos in in the midwest you know we want to be wise about what we're bringing in uh, but at the same time i think it's important for us to ask what was a part of their natural diet and how can we emulate that in a way here in a natural and perennial way that saves us money is better for the animal and is mostly off grid you know to solve solve that issue now I do want to go back real fast to the sweet feed I call it the sweet feed farce because this is probably one of the most common feeds that farmers give their animals now there are some good things in it. I mean oats barley corn Okay, you know, those are, are fairly decent things. Molasses, we have to have uh, primarily because that's good for the rumen of the animals, whether you're talking about goats or sheep or cows or whatever, that sweet uh, molasses and that sugar content helps them absorb other minerals. But the question we could also ask is how do I give those animals that type of a sugar content with something that is going to grow perennially instead of having to go and buy a mineral block or go and buy the sweet feed what if you could grow a mineral block? Now, I would say in Florida, we can. M many states cannot. I don't, I don't think many states are able to grow what we are able to grow, but I think literally, and, and I'll show you some, some numbers in, in a few minutes, I think we can grow mineral blocks in Florida and totally get away from those, adding those kind of things um, into our system. And even when you look at the continental United States, many of these type of things you can grow all over the United States and both the, the fruit and the, the actual green fodder of these plants have very high sugar content. It's weird because you look at things like mulberries and we often think, well, yeah, it's in the fruit. The leaves of mulberries has almost the same sugar, antioxidant and anthocyanin content as the berries do now the animals are mostly going to enjoy the leaves they're not going to be snacking as much well chickens will um, on the berries but why not offer them something that you can grow that you buy once I mean you think about a, a mulberry tree if you're going to buy a mulberry like this it's about 39 bucks that's a bag and a half of feed and then you're growing it forever that's a pretty good investment so at the end of the day what if you still keep doing the bagged feed, but you take one bag every time you go to the store and use one amount of that money to buy a new tree or a new plant, just to put in and try it. Don't scrap what you're doing and immediately transfer over. Phase it out and see what works for you or see if it works because it, it, it may or may not. 
So for us, one of the things that I've, I've come to realize is number one, I don't know everything. Um, I love learning. I love talking with farmers, both new farmers that are asking questions that I've just never thought of, but also sitting and listening to my grandpa just talk. You know, the other day, two days ago, the plow wasn't working and I literally could not figure it out. And so what do you do? You're not gonna be calling Tractor Supply Company and ask it because Lord knows they can't even fix a broken door handle at Tractor Supply, not even Home Depot anymore. You know, I, I'm calling grandpa. I'm calling my dad, I'm calling my grandpa to ask them, all right, here's a video, here's a FaceTime, let's, let's talk about how do we fix this, you know? And so I, I love the dialogue. And for me, from that dialogue, these are the top five adjustments that I have personally made and that I'm recommending to my clients the last five years to make, if you are gonna switch five things in your whole animal system, these are the five things um, that I would recommend. Um, first is changing the way that I deworm animals. Um, so we use something called Basic H. It actually came from the old Shackley company. It was like, kind of like Amway or you know whatever. Uh, and so what Basic H is, is it's a plant-based surfactant. Like a, uh, think of like Castile soap, but it's all plant-based. So there's no synthetics, there's no chemicals. It's all plant-based. So why does a cleaning product like that work as a dewormer? So one, because it's plant-based, uh, it's fully digestible to the animal and there's no withdrawal period on eggs. There's no waiting period on meat or on milking. It's fully digestible and bioavailable to the animal. The reason why it works is because worms, uh, parasites, uh, E. pylori, different types of bacteria, they have this mucosal lining like a mucus over them that protects them. So when a cow gets worms in its gut or in its rumen or a chicken gets a, a crop a crop worm of some sort, that worm is protected by this mucus. So what the cleaning surfactant does is it breaks that mucus lining so that the animal's natural acidity in the, in the stomach is able to literally digest the worm or the parasite. So we're taking away that defensive barrier of that worm or that parasite so the body can naturally flush it out. And literally the next day, you will see worms in the cattle poop. I mean, it is, it's a really remarkable thing. Now, how much does it cost? You'll save about 75%. So if you're using ivermectin, um, actually uh, my, my friend's um, son just did all the math on it for us last year, and it's about 75% cheaper than doing ivermectin per head, you know, of whatever it is that you're doing. So you don't use very much of it. For uh, birds, we use about one teaspoon in a five gallon bucket of water, and that's their only uh, access of water um, for the day. And then we use it all the way up on cattle. We've used it on horses. I've used it on goats. I've used it on sheep, I've used it on llamas, I've used it on pigs, I've even used it on dogs and cats, and it works fantastic. The first time that I did uh, use this, I was doing it with a veterinarian um, through the University of, uh, of or KU, uh, Kansas University, and so we were kind of watching to see, does it work as good as ivermectin? Now, she was not willing to say that it worked better, but she said it does work as good, and you do not need a withdrawal period, and she did test the uh, fecal test, and also did a blood test to see where the red, white blood cells and the hemoglobins were. So I was really impressed to see a vet go, yeah, I would say that works as good uh, as what you're doing. So for me, if I can give something to chickens where there's no withdrawal period on the eggs, that's a win. Or with goats and there's no withdrawal period on the milk or with cattle where I can literally deworm them and send them off for processing the next day, that is a really good win. The second thing is repopulating the biome, whether that biome is the gut or the rumen or the crop, whatever part of the biome. Uh, my personal favorite is I use one called Bio Livestock. This is a company called SCD Probiotics based out of Kansas City, Missouri. Some of their researchers are started at a university in Japan, uh, what I think is really unique about what they're doing is they have 11 different probiotics that are in one mother culture of sugar cane and rice uh, sugars, and they grow the probiotics together. This is different than most probiotics that are powdered because those are powdered and created in a Petri dish, put all together in one thing, and then hopefully some of them live. And that's why they do 
you know, 10 billion international units or whatever because they have no idea what's gonna live. What I like about this one is they are grown together. They're living together in a liquid form. And I have literally seen between basic H and that biome, I don't even know of a, a animal sickness problem that I've had that has not been helped by using those two things. I mean, they just, it really night and day difference. Number three is rotation and frequency. How, how often are we moving our cattle? How often are we moving our chickens or our ducks? Now, generally speaking, is if they get down to dirt, you should have moved them already. We should never really be seeing dirt on pasture in a chicken coop, in a duck pen. That dirt is just a breeding ground for salmonella, for E. coli, for E. pylori. I mean, we're just, we're propagating bad bacteria, both for us and for the animals. Um, so when, as soon as that grass starts getting down, getting them moved. Uh, number four, using multi-species in my rotations. Uh, not just doing Bahia grass or Augustine grass. I don't think those are bad. I'm not saying get rid of them, but consider maybe adding something else in. And then number five, every time I move animals, I am planting something behind them. They've already done the work. They've tilled up the ground. They fertilized the ground for me. Why would I not use that fertilizer, you know, and plant something right behind them? So now is the fun part to get into <laughs> the adjusted approach. This is actually from uh, my family house um, that's up in Traverse City. So these are some of our birds and this is a white Dutch clover field. And then we planted in some Shasta daisies for pollination and honestly it just looks really pretty um, through the pastures. And these, I mean these chickens eat for weeks and weeks and weeks, you know, off of those pastures. Um, so I don't know that we need to get into polyculture versus monoculture with this particular group, but I think it is important to note the vast majority of livestock uh, operations are primarily doing a monocrop, one type of grass, one type of seed, trying to remove anything and everything that you can. But the reality is a lot of those random weeds that come up are actually useful. Even uh, dog fennel, that's one of the banes of cattle farmers all over Florida is dog fennel, but it's actually incredibly useful well the cattle don't eat it of course they don't eat it it tastes terrible but what it does do is when the cattle walk past it those terpenes because it smells like fennel rubs up against the cattle and it's a natural insect repellent for cattle hornfly so even though the cattle are eating it it is doing something in the ecosystem what is it doing it's kind of like Biden's Alba you know Spanish needle I watched farmers literally pulling out Spanish needle pulling out Spanish needle well one it's a great uh, pollen Butterflies and honeybees love it. But two, Spanish needle, both Biden's Alba and its cousin Biden's Pilosa, is antibacterial, antiviral, and antifungal. So if you've got a sick animal, guess what they're going to be eating first? Biden's Alba. So why not? leave it on pasture. No, it's not St. Augustine grass. No, it doesn't look like the picture perfect American front yard, but man, your animals don't really care about a perfect, uh, you know, picture perfect American front yard. They don't follow your Instagram account anyway. So it doesn't really matter that much. So a couple suggestions for uh, ca uh, pasture improvement. So I did email out last night to everyone. Um, there's a document that gets into seed by seed or going by mix. <laughs> so the reason why I wanted to, to give this to you, one, it just shows you what's possible here. So the way that it's divided, <coughs> excuse me, is first it's divided by animal species. And if you're wanting to do a bagged feed or a bagged seed. <coughs> so one of the companies that I have in there is Hancock Seed Company. That one is found in Dade City. Uh, it is a family owned company. Uh, they actually are now doing stuff with Martha Stewart and Martha's Vineyard, which I think is a really cool, um, a cool connection for them. So they've got some really good non-GMO seed that is local, uh, semi-local here in Florida. Uh, the other one is uh, greencover.com has got some really good seed mixes. And what I like about those two companies is they give you a multi-species pasture mix for spring and for fall. So if you forget to do your spring planting, you just skip it and you wait until you can do the fall planting. And like in this one here, it's got eight or 10 different things for this warm season mix. So this one is uh, grazing, turnip and collards and buckwheat and sunflowers, a couple kinds of millet, sorghum, cow peas, mung beans. There's all these different species in there. Now are the cattle gonna eat everything in there? They may, 
But I got some cows that won't touch anything new because they're like my grandpa. It's not how they always done it. So sometimes with those picky cattle, you got to get real creative and make cow salad. You ever done that? You just go out and you get all the greens that you want them to start eating and then you just take your machete, you just release all the stress and the anxiety of the week with the machete and then mix in a little bit of their existing feed and put it in front of them. And slowly those things will be integrated into their diet. Now what I love about this is there's so many things in those type of mixes there are some years that I'm not going to get any turnips, but my millet is going to do awesome. There's some years I'm not going to get any millet, but maybe the sorghum or the mung beans are going to do really well. So when you're doing those multi-species, you're never out. You're never, you know, planting something and wasted all your money because it's not, it's not cheap, you know, to do this, especially when you're doing large acreage like this. I mean, we're buying by the pallet. I mean, literally buying seed by the pallet. So you're spending 4,000 bucks to reseed in the spring. But here's what's nice is you're not buying any bag feed and those seeds go back into the seed bank. So even in the pastures over here, they hadn't planted uh, cow peas in a couple years, but the cow peas keep coming back because they're just being reseeded. And if you start moving your chickens behind them, when we add like bird seed into our chicken feed, the chickens, when they eat it, they don't always digest all of it. So when they poop out millet, uh, millet sorghum, milo, sunflower seeds, literally they're planting the pasture behind them as they go and you come back in two months and there's literally sorghum growing in your pasture from your chicken feed. You know, so there's, there's some really good seed mixes. So in that handout that I gave you, if you can't find the handout, I did post it on permaculturefx.com. So if you're on your phone, you can uh, go down, click events, and you'll see a download button right there on your phone. I also divided, up, divided it up by individual seed. So if you don't want to mess with this and you just want to add in Timothy grass, I gave you the pounds per acre that you need uh, the month that you're going to plant it and then the potential benefit that it may have for your livestock. I would always encourage you to ease your livestock into something new. If they've never had it before, please don't just let them loose in a field of something that they've never had before. Even though they can have it, their rumens do need time to adjust. And so what we did this year, we planted a couple hundred acres of um, sun hemp or about 150 acres of sun hemp is before we let them fully in, we made cattle salad for a couple days and just added it into their feed, waited a little while. Then we put them into a pasture that only had a little bit of sun hemp and then we waited a while because anytime they eat something new, their stool might get a little loose. The rumen needs a little bit of time to adjust. It's like when you start taking a new vitamin or supplement and you get the runs. It just happens as your body is adjusting. It doesn't mean you stop taking the supplement. Let your body adjust to those new vitamins. Let your body adjust to the access to those new minerals so your body knows how it's going to utilize it. So hopefully that document will be helpful to you. Um, when I plant, I almost never recommend doing a full pasture. One, it's not economic, but two, it doesn't encourage biodiversity. Please excuse this drawing. This is my dad and I literally with Sharpie markers and uh, highlighters uh, decided how we were going to plant a deer plot for a wild deer feed. So this is a, a deer plot that we did and we always plant in the crosshatch method. So one year we're going to plant up and down, the next year we're going to go this way. So we till and plant a spot, we skip a row. Till and plant a spot, skip a row. Why would you do that? Because I want the biodiversity. I never want to fully destroy everything that was there before. I want it to be diverse. And so when you do that this way, maybe in the spring, maybe in the fall go this way and still skip rows change what you're planting and what happens over years is you're repopulating that seed bank and at about the five year mark you're tapering off to where you're almost never reseeding because the stuff does stay in that seed bank I mean many seeds will stay for for decades so don't think when you do this you have to do an entire pasture you might even do this and just go all the way around the outside edge one of my favorite poor man seed mixes is the red and white bag that just says wild bird seed on it from Tractor Supply Company because it's millet, milo, sorghum, uh, cracked corn, which because it's cracked, it won't grow, and sunflower. But four of the five things of those actually do work as viable seed. And so we grow them a lot in deer plots, but we've done them in pastures before, and it's all great for whether it's cattle or horses or chickens, you know, or whatever. In our family case, we use it as deer, uh, deer plots for deer hunting. So if you are uh, going to be reseeding, 
Three things to think about. One is multi-season. Don't just do it once a year. Try and do at least fall and spring. We're coming in right now. September is the ideal time to be getting some seed in the ground. The reason why is our temperatures are cooling off, but we've got three more weeks of rainy season. Thank you, Lord. So if, if we can capitalize on that free water, that does save a lot. Focus on multi-species every time you plant, if you can. But if you can't, Get whatever seed is on sale. Doing something is better than nothing. Doing something. Uh, and then always include a bean, a pea, a legume, a nitrogen fixing species. One, because our soil, can we even call it soil? The stuff under our feet in Florida is barely soil. It's just sand. All those minerals and nutrients are locked up. Anytime we can add nitrogen specifically, but especially as biomass to bring organic matter back to our soil is always going to be a good decision. Um, this was a greenhouse of ours in Traverse City, Michigan. So when we're at the end of our growing season, we do cover cropping for the entire winter. So we then this one, you can see clover, we did chicory. Uh, there's actually some random calendula, some, uh, some of the flowers that were left over. And then we literally send the chickens through the greenhouses. Now, do we have to, we can't really do that as much in Florida. You'd have roasted chicken if we did that in Florida. But the same concept is, you know, using the animals to till it for you, use it as fodder, use it as fertilization. And what's nice about doing it this way is when they're done scratching and eating, our annual vegetable bed, our annual vegetable bed has already been cleaned and tilled up by the chickens and we just plant right behind them. So it makes it really easy for a lazy man gardener like me. So the part that I'm really excited about for today, this is this is to me is the meat and the bones. Um, so before we get into this, we'll do a little bit of Q and A, um, and then we're gonna jump into this because this is the, the fun new stuff. So any questions that you've written down or thought about? On the basic H, uh, when do you get it? Does it have the breakdown for dosages for the different animal species or is that something It is an off, it's an off label use. <clears throat> so the Shackley company years ago, they were not able to officially recommend it for use of anything other than a cleaning product. <clears throat> but over the years, I think back in the 70s, they had this little booklet that was like a thousand uses for basic H and this was one of the uses back then and so what they started doing is they started testing it and there was two universities that actually tested it as a soil drench so they put it in the injector and they broadcast it when they watered and what they found out at the with the this was was a university study is because it breaks that water barrier it makes the water wetter so the roots were able to go deeper and absorb more nutrients so what for plants and so and then they started using it as an insecticide an insecticide replacement cattle was the same way it was published in Joel Salatin's book uh, salad bar beef so if you want to know where there's a published work that does have this as a um, animal dewormer Joel Salatin did publish that so what we do for larger animals is one cup per 100 gallons of water one cup per 100 gallons of water, or about one uh, teaspoon per um, water for chickens and for ducks. Uh, how often, good question. So normally deworming is kind of, a, it depends on your pastures, on your soil, how much, you know, how sick are the animals being, thanks. I typically try and do twice a year, I think is a really good, you know, kind of round. I like to do it right at the beginning of rainy season because they're, you know, all that rain is creating more bacteria, more fungal activity. Um, I do it at the end of rainy season just because it kind of eases them into the more stressful and dry winter months. Spring and fall. Spring and fall. Yeah, is typically what I do. And I, at the same time that I do it, I'll do the basic H. I'll wait for one or two days just to let that rumen rest. And honestly, it, it gives them diarrhea because they're cleaning out whatever might be in there. And then I always follow up with bio livestock or some type of probiotic because you've just flushed the rumen. So you want to repopulate that rumen with something that's beneficial. Basic age, there's no withdrawal period, no. Because it's all a plant-based surfactant, so it literally is absorbed as if they just ate a food. Mm -hmm. Which one what? Probiotics. The uh, bio-livestock. Oh, right. Yeah, yeah. 
And I just, I like that one because there's 11 different probiotics. So like the little packets, like at Tractor Supply, I think the best one has like six different probiotics in it. So I do like that one better. How much do you use of the probiotics? Uh, it, is, it is written on here. Oh, so okay. this one, um, we use three cups per 100 gallons on cattle, but it's gonna be different for poultry, for dogs, for whatever, but they do uh, write on there the, the rate. Sorry, can you say yep. When you're planting, um, how long do they need to stay off the pasture? Yeah, it's going to be different per thing. So uh, like per mix that you have, I like to try and get it almost knee high. But like this year, because of our weird rain, you know, the grass blades were only like this. And then it already started like, you know, flowering, which the, the cows don't like that. Well, like once they've gotten to that point, they want the blades of grass, you know, so things like um, clover are going to be a lot longer. Those could be 120 days or whatever. Sun hemp is really fast growing. You can put them on sun hemp with, uh, about four to six weeks in. I like to let it get a little bit taller, about 60 to 90 days, uh, because then you can get a second bloom on it, which ours are doing the second bloom right now. So it's going to depend on what seed you're putting in. You know. Yes, yeah, that's a really important thing to note. Thank you. So sun hemp is fantastic for uh, horses, for goats, for sheep. Llamas can have it, obviously cattle. Uh, the, the key with sun hemp, once it begins to flower, it, it's a legume, it's not hemp in the cannabis family, so it's a legume. So when once the crotal area begins to get those yellow flowers, immediately your protein drops dramatically from like 27% bioavailable protein to 18 or 19 percent like really major drop the moment you see it flower if it produces the bean the bean can actually be toxic to cattle and livestock so you absolutely the moment you see it flower that's your flag your yellow flag get the cattle on it get the cattle on it get the cattle on it and then they eat it down so ours we put them on about a month ago and we, and it was like right as the yellow was coming out and we still don't have yellow on it yet. And we'll have at least one more. We might even get a third flush um, on it this year. So yeah, that's really important. Always, always feed uh, legumes if you can before they produce a fruit.